Hello and welcome everybody. Thanks for joining today. Uh, my name is Chris Mitchell, Chief Technology Officer here at Inflow Communications and I'll be leading today's webinar. We're going to be talking about disaster recovery with your MyTel Shortel system. If you haven't had a chance to look at our upcoming webinars, we got a, we got actually three of them next week coming up. We have um, the customer engagement strategy, a starting point. So for customers that are looking for, you know, in, in the contact center space, uh, you know, if you're looking to kind of maybe change how you're handling your calls. Uh, it's a great starting point to talk about that. Uh, we also have a 14.2 to connect migration uh, webinar next week. So if you're still on 14.2, you haven't upgraded to connect, you know, you can hop on that and, you know, kind of hear what, you know, what to expect, what the process is for upgrading from 14.2 to connect. And then we're wrapping it up next week with a creative contact center solutions with Genesis Cloud. So, um, you know, we do a lot of MyTel business uh, but a lot of our customers are looking to migrate to some cloud-based contact centers so it's a you know a great chance to you know see a demo in in, in some features of a, of a cloud contact center so uh hit the we have some new june webinars that are that are, are if they're not on the website soon uh or today they'll be up, up there soon so we have a whole bunch of new webinars coming out for june as well all right well i'll do a quick introduction of who is inflow communications and i'll jump right in and we'll talk about redundancy capabilities, and then I'll jump in and do uh, redundancy scenarios. So if you have questions as we're going, feel free to put them in the question sections. And I'll try to answer them as I go through each scenario uh, or whatever. A lot of them I'll answer during the, the presentation, but feel free to put those in there. If I don't get a, to a question during the scenarios, I'll hit them at the end. Uh, if there's, by some reason, I can't answer a, call, a question on the webinar today, uh, then we'll follow it via email, but it's pretty rare. But Every once in a while that happens. All right, so Info Communications, if you're new to our webinar series, we're a unified communications and contact center company. That's all we do. Um, we do a lot of uh, short tail, my tail. We're a platinum partner with them. Uh, we're also a Ring Central preferred partner. There's only a few, a few of those in the in the U.S. And then we're a Genesis Pure Cloud Gold partner. So we have some cloud offerings to kind of mix with our with our on-premise offerings for our customers. So. We have employees uh, in 10 states, soon to be 11 states. Uh, we've actually had a couple of recent new hires, which is awesome. Uh, we support over 250,000 endpoints, spanning 800 customers with, late, with nation, or nationwide uh, headquarters and worldwide locations. So uh, we're maniacal about customer experience. So we post our webs, you know, our staff on our website around first response time, customer satisfaction, customer comments, that kind of stuff. Our customers span all kinds of different uh, industries uh, and sizes, so these are just a few of our, our marquee customers that you know that we work with. All right, well, we're going to jump right in. So, the, uh, like I said, first I'm going to start off by talking about the redundancy options of the you know the short tail mytel system. We'll kind of talk through you know what the different options are, and then we'll go through some scenarios in you know different outage scenarios. So. Redundancy capability. So this is a, a simple two-site system setup. Um, it could be multiple site. If you have one site, it, maybe it's just like the Portland location. You know, some of the redundancies change, but most of our customers are multi-site. So I typically talk around multi-site redundancies when I talk through. So you could replicate this to as many locations as you need. We have custom, we have a customer with you know like 80 or 90 locations, so they could replicate the same setup as needed, you know, for, for their bigger locations. Uh, and you, don't, and you don't have to do all of these redundancies. You can kind of pick and choose what fits into your needs and in your budget. So uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is DVSs. So uh, DVSs provide redundancies to, to the headquarters server. A DVS can handle uh, like desktop client, auto attendant, voicemail, work group. Um, it, it can have paging groups assigned, you know, assigned to it. So all the kind of basic use cases that you would need for, you know, still taking calls from your customer in the case of a headquarters, you know, server outage or, or disconnection, you know, from a site. The things that the DVS can't do, it can't do, you know, administration. It can't do reporting. It can't do directory. Um, it can't, you know, assign a, or, or like kind of pre-program a brand new phone. Or so if the headquarters server is down, I plug in a new phone and I want it, you know, to kind of connect up and get assigned. I can't do that. Existing phones already connected are fine, uh, but it can't, you know, program a brand new device without the headquarters um, server and database being up. But you could provide your normal, important services, to, you know, to take to send and receive calls with your customers. So 
So in this case, I have I put a DVS in Portland and in San Jose. Why would I put a DVS at my headquarters site? Well, the main reason is is a DVS handling voicemail boxes for for users. If that DVS were to fail, the headquarters server can take over the voicemail and auto attendant services for that DVS. If my mailbox is assigned to the headquarters server in Portland and the headquarters server goes down, it doesn't I can't fail down to a server. So the DVS can't take over my voicemail capabilities for the headquarters server. It only fails up to the headquarters server. So in a lot of our customers um, you know, kind of design what they end up doing is they put a DVS at their main site and they assign all the users' voicemail to the DVS. That way, the headquarters server isn't the primary for any voicemail services. It's just a backup. The headquarters server can back up the DVS in Portland and the DVS in San Jose in case of an in case of an outage. So that's why a lot of customers will put a DVS at their headquarters site so that they have some voicemail redundancy. Especially if you're in a virtual environment and you have maybe um, two different virtual clusters, you know, or hosts that you can put your headquarters and DVS on, that gives you a little bit more redundancy from a virtual standpoint as well if they're, if both servers aren't on the same virtual host. Or maybe we have a few customers who have different SANs actually for, you know, for, for different clusters and they can spread that out and give a little bit more redundancy from, you know, for, from a server perspective. The next uh, redundancy capability is phone switches at each site. By putting phone switches at each site, that gives us a call control capabilities, that gives us analog line, you know, analog line, analog devices, and dial tone capabilities at each site. So we'll talk through a couple of redundancy scenarios when they fail. Uh, spare switches. So in this case, you see I've, I've labeled spare switches. They're physical switches. They don't have to be physical, just easier to represent a spare switch being physical. But spare switches can be physical or virtual. Um, and if you're on 14.2 right now, you can spin those spare switches up in VMware at no cost. If you're on Connect, you can spin those spare switches up in VMware or Hyper-V at no cost. So the nice thing about a spare switch is it can handle, you know, up to a thousand phones failing over to it, but it is a one-to-one -one failover. So if a switch in Portland fails, all the users fail over to the spare switch. If I only have one spare switch, if another switch were to have a problem, I don't have a second spare switch to, for that switch to fail over to. So if you have a bigger environment, you may want to consider multiple spare switches because it is a one-to-one -one failover. Uh, and then once I've corrected my switch failure issue, I can fail the phones back and put that spare switch back into standby mode. Um, when There's no licensing cost for the spare switch, like I said, but when you do fail over a spare switch into production, it does trigger your 45-day license counter. So you have 45 days to fix your, you know, your switch issue, fail the, you know, the phones back to the primary switch and put that spare switch back into standby mode uh, before you have to purchase licensing, which typically isn't a problem. Usually we can, usually, you know, working with support, you can get that switch back up and running same day or next day. Uh, even if we need a replacement, you know, we can get a next day replacement for that switch. So dial tone at each site. So. Uh, a lot of our customers have dial tone each site. Some of them, from to cost savings, are, are reducing dial tone, you know, maybe to just their big locations. But one of the ways you can provide additional redundancies is by having dial tone at each individual site, so that when you lose connection, you know, between two sites, that site can still send and receive calls uh, outside the system. Inbound call failover. So if you do have multiple. Uh, you know, sites that have dial tone, you can do inbound PSTN failover, or inbound DID failover with your carrier. That's a carrier, you know, specific feature. And in most cases, it takes SIP trunking, you know, to, to be set up like this. Most of the, the, you know, the older PRIs, if you have any old school PRIs still, they don't typically have a portal that you can kind of log into and set up inbound failover. It's typically a, a ticket that gets created with the carrier anytime that occurs. But with SIP, you can do automatic inbound um, call failover. And the last option that we'll talk about is backup WAN connection. So if you have a, you know, a backup VPN or something like that, that you know, backs up your current connection uh, between sites, MPLS, or whatever, you know, SD-WAN or something like that, if you have multiple connections that can connect your sites, that'll just allow you to you know, continue doing extension to extension calling, um, syncing databases, that kind of stuff, uh, least cost routing, uh, if you have multiple internet connections. All right, so let's talk about a WAN outage. So we have two sites in this scenario. Our MPLS or whatever, you know, our primary connection between sites goes down. You know, what does that look like? You know, um, some things that rely on the internet connection is the DVS server 
the DVS server syncs with the headquarters server for database. It only has a read-only copy of the database, so it has a it's on a you know on a sync to to check in and, and synchronize this database. So it ha always has a local you know current copy of the database. The switches all check in with the DVS or the headquarters server for updating of routing tables and everything like that. So if a call comes in and hits one of the switches or DVSs and says, "Oh, I need to route this call to you know to Portland," then it would look and try to route that call across that that primary WAN connection. So if that's down, if we have a, a backup VPN or something like that, even if it's a lower speed connection, you know, it, it's better than nothing. We may have a, a, a few call quality issues on like a backup VPN or something rather than a dedicated circuit or something. But in mo for most customers, you know, having that connection so that we don't lose, you know, site to site connectivity, it, it, you know, it's worth having a couple call quality issues rather than not being connected, you know, at all. So each call only uses about 80, you know, 80K worth of bandwidth. So even having, you know, a, a small cable connection of, you know, 20 megs or something like that is typically more than enough to, you know, to be able to send calls back and forth, extension calls, you know, and, and voicemail calls and stuff like that back and forth as needed. So without that backup VPN, you know, or backup connection in place, when that WAN goes down, you know, the San Jose site is, is going to become a standalone site. You know, it's only going to be able to transfer calls within its own site. Um, but the, the DVS in San Jose can take voicemails on behalf of, you know, users in Portland. And then when Portland comes back up, it'll synchronize the voicemails back over. Uh, but with the local DVS in San Jose, our desktop clients, you know, our phones, our switches, that kind of stuff is still going to work. Our local work groups will work. Our local hunt groups, all that functionality stays, the same, you know, stays up and, uh, and working. That's the most common scenario, internet outage for customers. Internet outage, but you know, uh, if we don't have dial tone or something like that in San Jose, you know, we're gonna lose our access to our dial tone. And, that, and that's typically the biggest concern for customers if they have, uh, the reason why they put local dial tone in each site. All right, so dial tone, PSTN, you know, if it's SIP trunks, PRI, analog line, whatever it is, you know, if, if one site loses dial tone, you know, how do we handle that? The nice thing is, is with least cost routing and stuff, outbound calls could be rerouted to a different site. You know, so if a user, you know, in Portland needs to pick up, the, you know, pick up a call or, you know, a phone, a phone or something like that, they can, they can still use the San Jose dial tone. But from an inbound perspective, the short tail system, my tail system has no control over inbound calls. So that has to be done at the carrier level. So dial tone goes down in Portland. If we want the inbound calls to fail over to San Jose, the carrier sets that up calls start get start getting forwarded over to over to San Jose the San Jose switches are smart enough to realize the call coming in came in and says oh this phone number is actually for Chris Mitchell who actually is in Portland not San Jose let me go grab that call I'm going to route it back across my my MPLS connection to Portland and ring it back to Chris's phone that's the advantage of redundant dial tone and inbound PSTN failover is that I can utilize my MPLS connection to route my calls back to the original user in Portland you know, via the, the dial tone in San Jose. So a lot of flexibility there, but like I said, is typically it needs to be SIP in order for that to, you know, to work. Your your carriers at your sites don't have to be the same carrier. So you could have, let's say, AT&T in one location and, and CenturyLink in another location. That's perfectly fine. It is easier if it's the same carrier, both, both locations, because then the carriers do what they call trunk group failover, and they literally just fail all the phone numbers from one location over to the other. When you fail carrier to carrier, you have to fail over to DIDs. So you say, oh, this phone number in Portland fails to this phone number in San Jose, and we build like a big routing table. So it is capable of failing over between carriers uh, if needed. So I think that answered the, the one question that I saw there. All right, so next scenario is a switch going down. So there's two scenarios here we'll, we'll kind of talk about. Phone switches, really easy. Phone switch goes down, the spare switch, you know, takes over. A spare switch will take over all of the IP phone resources and all, and all of the hunt groups assigned to that, you know, to that IP phone switch. So those are like your SG90s, SG50s. Um, if you're on a newer, you know, any of the newer switches, the ST50, the ST100 for the connect switches, uh, the spare switch will take over. The cool thing about those switches is those switches don't, run the actual like call you know traffic or, tr or call packets through those switches so if i'm talking to you know luis you know who's on the call with me today from inflow if we're, if we're talking on a phone call and my switch goes down my call's already built up and already i'm not even going to drop that call 
The only calls that are going to drop when a switch fails is calls that are ringing right now that haven't been connected yet because that switch is doing call buildup. So that switch fails, all the IP phones and the hunt groups fail over to the spare switch. The next call that comes in is on the spare switch. It's able to ring, you know, my phone. I pick it up. I can answer it, you know, in that case. So spare switches are awesome to replace your IP phones, you know, switches um, that are handling phones uh, in hunt groups. If there is any analog devices connected to that switch, obviously they will be disconnected, like fax machines or paging systems, until that, you know, the you know the, the primary switch is back up and running because we can't fail over analog devices. The second thing to consider is if one of your dial tone switches fail. So if if we have like, you know, maybe we have SIP or you know or PRI, if we have a single PRI or single you know SIP switch only and that goes down, we're gonna be in a you know dial tone outage like we had in the previous scenario. But maybe we have a bigger site and it has two PRIs or maybe it has multiple, you know, maybe it has a lot of you know SIP trunks or something like that. If one of those dies and we have a you know a secondary PRI switch or a secondary SIP switch up and running, we lose half our capacity, but we don't necessarily lose all of our dial tone. So that's the other thing to consider is you're spinning up you know dial tone at sites is um, a lot of our customers that are going to SIP are going to virtual SIP switches instead of physical because they have more redundancies in a virtual environment than than a physical you know appliance uh, you know from Mitel uh, has. So if we if we're in a virtual environment, we get a little bit more flexibility. Uh, from a redundancy standpoint, maybe a virtual host goes out, we can use like vMotion or high availability to move that virtual, you know, SIP switch over to a different host. And we can, you know, then we can continue taking and receiving calls um, in a, you know, in a host outage that, that's affecting um, a VMware Hyper-V. So that's the thing to consider. Spare switches are great for, for IP phones, but they don't, spare switches don't back up um, dial tone switches. So we can either, if you're doing a virtual environment, you can actually spin up two SIP switches, you know, and have kind of load balance between the two, registering to like a session border controller or something like that. Or if you have PRI, if you have two PRIs, they'll have two PRI switches. So that's kind of your your switch redundancies that you can do um, there. So DVS goes down. We talked about this a little bit up front. Why you you know why you put DVSs? So if the DVS in San Jose or the DVS in Portland goes down, or in this case, they could even both go down. You know, um, the headquarters server will take over auto attendant, desktop client, and voicemail services automatically for those DVSs. So inbound outbound calls are still going to function. Inbound calls that need to hit an auto attendant can you know can get an auto attendant from the headquarters server. Voicemails can still be left. When the DVSs come back up, the headquarters server says, oh, I have 10 voicemails for San Jose server, and I have 20 voicemails for the Portland server, and it'll resynchronize those voicemail, you know, voicemails back to the mailboxes. The one thing you got to do a little bit more planning on is if you're using work groups. Work groups are assigned to, to a server, so if I have a work group assigned to my San Jose DVS, and that DVS goes down, all calls are going to route to the workgroup's backup extension, whatever that's set to. So maybe that backup extension is set to a user in San Jose, perfect. Or to a hunt group in San Jose, that works as well. If we need a backup workgroup to take calls, the, the best thing to do there would be to copy that workgroup and name it San Jose Backup, you know, Operators, you know, whatever the name is. And then you assign that backup to the headquarters server. So that way you back up one work group with another work group on a different server. And then all you have to do is in your, in your work group on the San Jose server, set the backup extension to be the headquarters server work group. The cool thing about work groups is you actually have up to two la you know, layers of failover. So on the headquarters backup work group, you could set the backup extension on that server to a San Jose user or a San Jose hunt group. And if for some reason, you lost the San Jose DVS and the headquarters server at the same time. Call it would try to hit the San Jose DVS for the work group. That didn't that didn't answer. It would try to hit the headquarters server for the backup work group. If that doesn't answer, then would it would route to the backup work group's backup destination, which could be an extension or a hunt group at San Jose. So you actually have you can do three layers of routing on a you know, and that's how many routes each switch can can attempt. It can attempt three routes. So primary backup and then you know and then whatever the third destination is that's you know that's how many attempts we can do for routing purposes so your third 
routing, you know, would would, would want to be an extension or a hunt group that's off, you know, off of a server. So you have a, you know, that additional layer of redundancy if if you had multiple DBSs go out. And that would typically only be if there was like a major SAN, you know, if you had a major SAN issue, um, or there maybe it was a virtual bug, or, you know, in VMware Hyper-V that was causing, you know, uh, mass issues, uh, you know, with with multiple sites, uh, uh, virtual environments. All right, so headquarters site goes down, you know, headquarters server goes down. So, you know, this is, you know, I'd say isn't super common, but every once in a while it's, it's running on a Windows box. So, you know, there's there's Microsoft Windows issues, you know, that do pop up. When that headquarters server goes down, the nice thing is, is if we've designed it right, all of our voicemail boxes are assigned to a DVS, which means the DVS is, is processing all of our auto attendant calls, all of our voicemail calls, it's handling all of our desktop clients. The DVS is, you know, if it's designed the same way, it's handling all the work group calls. So when the headquarters server goes down, we don't actually affect any of our inbound, you know, calling issues that our customers are gonna see. We lose our admin interface, yes, we lose our reporting, we lose our directory services, you know, some of those things, we, we lose those, but those aren't necessarily, you know, customer affecting issues. Customers can still call in, you can still call customers back, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. If we have an enterprise contact center server, you know, we can still route calls over to enterprise contact center. You know, the headquarters server doesn't affect routing because the routing all happens at the switch level. You know, the short gear switches have the full routing tables in it. So with the DVS in Portland, in this case, we can, we can have the headquarters server go down and not actually affect, in most cases, our end users wouldn't even know, and thus they would like pick up their phone or try to hit the directory button on their phone then they'll get like a, an error on their phone saying the director of service is unavailable. Okay, not the end of the, you know, not the end of the world that the director in the phone is, you know, isn't gonna work um, in that case because they can still send and receive calls. So the DBS in Portland is the one that really makes this kind of, you know, not visible to your employees by having a DBS in Portland. If your DBS isn't in Portland and that, hit, and that server goes down, San Jose is going to still function perfectly fine. San Jose has his own voicemail server, auto attendant, but in Portland, without that DVS, they're going to lose access to the desktop client, you know, to their to their to their voicemails, um, you know, into auto attendant services. The, the switches have like a basic auto attendant built into them that just says, if you know your extension, you can enter it now. Is pretty much what it says. And any time an auto attendant would need to be played, that was that's what would play because the call's not going to say, oh. I need an auto agent. Let me send the call all the way back to San Jose and then San Jose back to Portland to a user. The system won't do that for you because the headquarters, you know, it won't go down to a DVS. It only goes up to the headquarters server. So in this case scenario, the DVS is really saving the Portland site, making it st a still fully functioning site by having a DVS at your, at your main site. So if you don't have a DVS currently at your main site, it might be a consideration, you know, to something to consider so that you can provide those additional redundancies for voicemail, auto within a desktop client work groups. Uh, those are the, the four main functions, you know, that it can provide for you. Paging groups, stuff like that you can, you can also do, but they're less common uh, use cases for the DBS. Nice thing about DBS too is if you have a virtual environment, great, you know, you can spin it up. They do make, they uh, in Connect, they have a Linux-based DBS that you can spin up. Most of our customers still prefer the Windows one because you get a little bit more control over it. Um, but you can spin up a Windows server. There is a one-time license cost to spin up a DBS. You gotta, you know, you have to purchase a one-time license for the DBS from Mitel um, in order to spin that up. Uh, but your account manager, you know, or a sales rep can, can assist with that piece. All right, so, you know, the, the big issue, the whole Portland site goes down. Maybe you're in a building. We actually had this, you know, we had a lot of customers in Portland. Um, we, had a, we had a site, um, a whole building in downtown Portland lost power last year. And, you know, the, the power company says, you know, we'll have a generator, uh, you know, a trailer generator on site, but it won't be, you know, it won't be set up, you know, and up and running until tomorrow's business day. You know, so they pretty much told everybody in the building, go home for the day because this building has no power. Um, you know, if you have your own generator or something like that temporarily, that's going to, you know, it's going to work. But most customers didn't, you know, if they're in a big office building like that. So the whole site lost power. So for those users, 
they couldn't, you know, they could just go home and say, oh, I'll use my extension remotely or anything like that because the headquarters server controls all of that stuff. So the Portland users were completely down. San Jose users could still send and receive calls. Um, their voicemail, their desktop client, their work groups, you know, all that kind of stuff functioned. They lost access to their admin interface, you know, their reporting and everything like that. But San Jose was able to function on its own with its read-only database and its routing tables um, perfectly fine. The way you could kind of back this up for some of our customers that are looking, if you're looking to create headquarters site redundancy where, you know, if power goes out, you don't lose every, you know, you don't lose everything on that site. Some of our customers have decided to move their headquarters server and maybe a couple of spare switches and some dial tone to a data center. That would pretty much create your Portland site looking like San Jose. It would really just be a remote site and the data center would host your headquarters server, you know, a spare switch or two and, you know, in a little bit of dial tone in there so that the, the, the data center could provide you redundancy, you know, to Portland or San Jose in the case of an outage. Because in this scenario, there's not much we can do. If you have a backup of the headquarters server, we could spin that up, you know, in a data center or spin it up in San Jose and get the headquarters server back up and, you know, back up and running if we know it's going to be down for multiple days. That might be a scenario we want to, that we want to consider spinning that backup of the headquarters server, you know, up in a different location, you know, so that we can, we can then at least manage the phone system, uh, take calls through San Jose, forward it to cell phones, stuff like that, you know, for, for users that are maybe working remotely on cell phones uh, for the time being. But one way to kind of get around that would be to use a data center. In the future, we're hoping that Mitel will certify AWS, Google Cloud, or Azure for hosting of, of HQ servers. As of right now, their only limitation is your headquarters server has to be running in VMware or Hyper-V. That's their requirement. So we have a couple customers testing with VMware or Hyper-V, you know, VMware, maybe say in AWS, you know, or, or something like that. And that would be supported if, as long as the, the server is running on a VMware or Hyper-V environment, you know, it's, it's a supported platform at that point. Uh, but most of our customers at this point are still using data centers um, instead of a, a cloud provider for hosting of, of headquarters server. We're hoping in the future that that is an option for customers is to be able to host, um, you know, in a cloud provider. So I think that answers the, the question I saw there around AWS. And that's usually our biggest customer question from customers is, can I spin my headquarters server up in AWS? I would love to. Um, and the answer is yes, if you do the AWS VMware spin up, but it's really expensive still. The AWS VMware servers that you can get um, are quite a bit more expensive than just spinning up a regular Windows server in AWS. So we don't have any customers that are running in a production. We have a couple of customers testing, but from a cost perspective, it's pretty, you know, it's pretty expensive to do that at this point. And then the other concern you have is when you go to the cloud is what do you do for like spare switches and dial tone? You know, it gets a little bit harder. Uh, you know, when we're going to the cloud for, for providing spare switches and, and dial tone in the cloud. So we're hoping that long term, yes, that is an option uh, for customers. But right now, um, not, not really feasible at this point. All right, we got a couple, we got like a minute left here. I don't think, I don't see any questions I didn't answer um, through the, through each of the scenarios. If you do have questions around this, or maybe you want to evaluate your, uh, you know, your DR setup and what, you know, what, what you have, or maybe what you, you know, you would like to implement, feel free to reach out to us, hit your account manager, hit your, you know, sales rep, or send us an email at, at contact info communications, and we'll schedule an engineer to hop on a call with you and kind of evaluate your current system and, you know, and find out what, you know, what disaster recovery, you know, scenarios or redundancies that could be put into, you know, into your system to provide you with a little bit more, uh, you know, redundancies, or maybe, it's something to say, hey, like, you know, can I back it up with a cloud, with, with some cloud service or something like that? We can, we can help you and work on a, a scenario to, you know, back it up with a cloud auto and back it up with, with, you know, with a full cloud contact center or something like that. You know, we can, we can work on different scenarios to evaluate your, um, your redundancy capabilities and, you know, what fits into your budget and, you know, and what fits into the needs uh, of your business. So appreciate you joining today and look forward to seeing you on another webinar in the future. Thank you.